Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks very much, J.W. Well, my name is Bill, and I am an alcoholic. And I know it's routine to begin by thanking everybody who is responsible for my being here. And I wish there was some way of expressing my thanks without it sounding routine. I have done this kind of thing a couple of times before. But I have never, 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 ever been more thankful than I am to be with you this weekend, with you here in Hilton Head. I was never more thankful to be with any other people. I arrived here from the far side of the country, and I was in thoroughly bad shape. Uh, I guess, I don't know whether you're the same as me or I'm the same as you, but... uh, even with being in this program, times come when I go temporarily insane. <laughs> literally, literally. And I was right in the middle of one, my, one of my in, in, insanity bouts when I arrived here. You see, about two days before, oh dear, I had been asked to talk about us, to talk about AA, to talk about us alcoholics to an audience of non-alcoholics, as a matter of fact, to an audience consisting of my own bishop and a whole crowd of clergy. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever read the chapter. We were reminded of a lot of the things in the big book last night by Doug. But there's one sentence in there. It's the chapter that's headed into action talks about taking a fifth step, talks about taking it sometimes with those kind. (laughs) And when you read that, read the sentence it says immediately after suggesting you might want to take it with those kind, because it says, however, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. (laughs) Beware, it's true. (laughs) And, of course, I went on hell-bent to make them understand alcoholics. (laughs) Boy, did I make a jackass of myself. (laughs) And I was suffering from the results of it when I arrived here. You see, I'd been on an ego trip to end all ego trips, to put them right about absolutely everything, and I was the one to do. You know... Well, you know who suffered. And as soon as I arrived, two lovely, lovely ladies met me, Mary and her sister Helene, and I was almost on the verge of uh, <clears throat> total disintegration because I had been thinking, you know, the way it goes around and around. <laughs> so I told them about it, and then I told anyone I could grab among you all about it. <laughs> Student J.W. and Bob, and I don't know who all. And I'm okay now. (laughs) Because I'm with people who do understand me, and I understand. God, aren't we lucky. We're lucky to be us. My name is Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. Not was. Am. Thank you. I am physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually loused up. (laughs) But I'm with the remedy. And I want to express my deepest, deepest conviction and awareness that when I'm in this company, I'm in the presence of a mysterious power. I'm in a mysterious presence. A lovely presence. A powerful presence. A mysterious presence, a benign, loving, 
loving presence and a humorous presence. And it's lovely to be here. I'm going to try to say all you people mean to me, and it's impossible to say. But I want to share myself with you to the little extent that I'll be able to, without this time trying to impress anybody. I've talked to you already long enough for all of you to realize <clears throat> that I was not born and raised in the United States. <laughs> I was born and raised where all the real alcoholics come from. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. I go back there, you know, sometimes. As I'll indicate to you, I left Ireland when I was only 15. But I go back there. I was back there fairly recently. I go back to uh, brush up on my brogue, you know. <laughs> and I was back there the year before last. I wish Doug were here. I don't know if he's... St is, is Doug here? Speaker last night? No? Well, anyway, he, he reminded me of someone I met, or heard about, sorry, when I was on my vacation in Ireland last year, someone else from Texas. This Texan was over there on, on vacation, and the story was going the rounds when I arrived. Now, this Texan guy had gotten in with an Irish farmer, and he asked the farmer to show him around his little farm. So he did, and when he saw it, the Texan said, Oh, you know, gee, uh, back in Texas, where I come from, you don't call it a farm, you call it a ranch. Give you an idea of the size of it, he said there. Uh, if I got into my car to go around my ranch at sunrise, by the time the sun would have set, I wouldn't have gotten halfway around. And the Irish farmer looked at him and he said, Is that a fact? He said. You know, he said, I had a car like that once. <laughs> You see what they're like, what they're like over there. <clears throat> I got the use of the car while I was over there myself uh, this last time. And as I told you, I left Ireland when I was very young. And I used to know Dublin when I was young, but it's all changed now. And downtown Dublin is all one-way streets. And I was looking for one particular street in this car I had the use of. Any time I ever came near it, the arrows were always pointing away, away. No matter what angle I came at. So I got frustrated and I pulled into the curb and I put the window down and one of the natives was passing the sidewalk. I said to him, hey, Pat, I said, how do I get to Thomas Street? So he looked up the street and he looked down the street and he scratched his head and he said, Father, he said, to get to Thomas Street, you wouldn't really start from here at all, he said. <laughs> I knew I was home. <laughs> I was home. <laughs> well, that's what they're like. That's what I'm like. I was born over there a long time ago in a little Irish village in the south of Ireland, where everybody is Roman Catholic because there's nothing else to be. <laughs> and I... Uh, was sent to school in the usual way. In the first school I went to, we were all taught by the nuns. Then we graduated from there and went to another school. We were taught by what's called religious brothers. And then there was another school in the village. It was called the classical school. It was a wonderful place. You could learn all kinds of languages there. and I couldn't tell you what all. But they, the teachers there were all priests. So as you can imagine, as I was growing up, I heard an awful lot about God. God, did I ever. God, he haunted me. He really did. And uh, God was more real to me when I was a kid and when I was a young boy growing up than people were that I could see with my two eyes. Now, I better tell you that as I tell you my story, I'm looking back at myself, the life that's behind me. I'm looking back from the vantage point of a number of years in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I hope that some of that 
E.E. E. has rubbed off on me to restore me somehow or other to, to sanity. But as I look back at myself, even from the beginning I know now that I was weird. <laughs> Dreadfully weird. I wasn't normal at all. Never was. Because when I was a kid, I lived in a world all my own. I don't know why, or I know now that other kids just aren't that way. When I was a kid, this God thing, God, it meant, it meant stuff to me that I know it didn't ever mean to anyone else at all. I used to, when I was a kid, spend hours in, in, in the church, in, in, in Ireland, in the village, you call it the chapel. It was open all day, and I'd be down there in the church when everyone else and all the other kids would be doing what kids do, playing games and enjoying them. And I'd be in there. I don't know what in the world I was doing there. I can't recall, but that's where I always was. I remember uh, the question coming up at school, and what age I was at the time, I can't recall exactly. But the question was, what is the biggest thing a human being can do with their life? What's the biggest thing you can do? And I remember everybody giving this answer and that. And I remember then the real answer being given to us. It's in the good book. What is the first and the greatest of all the values of all the commandments? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, whole soul, and whole mind. Do that. You've done the biggest, biggest thing a human being can do. Bigger than getting to the moon and back. Bigger than finding a cure for cancer. Bigger than making a million or a billion. Get to love God with all your power of loving. That's the ultimate in achieving success in living. That got into my little mind way, way back, I can't tell you when. And it went away, way, way, way down into my absolute guts. And it's there still. I still believe that. I go to my grave believing it. And I said to my little self, way, way back then, that's what I am going to do. Why not? If it's the biggest thing a human being can do. I had one brother, one brother. He was sane. <laughs> he had other ideas. And he regarded me as a nut. But it was quite mutual. And to this hour... I honestly can't understand why anybody wants to make a million or a billion or whatever. I can't understand it. I really can't. It's like someone wanting to have ten million chairs. You've only got one, you know what. <laughs> Getting to... Getting some gorgeous girl, you know, gorgeous woman into your life that love you, and you get to love her, oh my goodness, there's the ultimate, surely. But she's going to get old. <laughs> her teeth are going to fall out. She's going to get droopy. <laughs> you lose it all, no matter what it is. That's the way I saw life. That's the way I saw it. What's the good of anything? What's the good of anything except one thing? And anyway, that's the way I thought. Now, as I tell you my story, I'm telling you that it's the story of a crazy loon. But there may be some among you that might say to yourself, it's not so crazy. Keep coming back. Okay, well, that was what I decided, and I decided also that I wasn't, uh, uh, I don't ever remember making a decision to become a priest. I never remember making that decision. Nobody suggested it to me, and as far back as I can remember, that decision was there, right in there. That's what I wanted to be. I never remember 
come into it. And uh, I, they also told me that uh, if you wanted to go in for an honors course in this business of loving God perfectly, perfectly, then if you wanted to do that, well, really, you need to leave home, leave your family, leave everybody and everything, go way out far to convert the heathen. I said, okay, if that's it, that's it. And I began to wonder, where's the most heathen spot in all this world? (laughs) Ah, you've heard it before, I can tell. But don't forget, you see, I was born and raised in the south of Ireland. Not that place up there in the north, in the south of Ireland. So where's the most heathen spot in the world? England, of course. Right? <laughs> and so at the ripe old age of 15, I decided to pack my little bag. I had heard about certain prospects over there. And I told my mother and my father that I was going over to a prep school in the north of England, run by monks. Uh, and after I would have graduated from that particular kind of school, I'd go into the monastery and become a monk myself and become a priest. And I was going to convert the whole of England. And that was the program. And that's what I did. I went, my father, God rest him, brought me up to Dublin, the main city, put me on the little ship that goes across the Irish Sea, across to Liverpool in England. And I went to a, out onto the Yorkshire Moors there, a big monastery, a big school run there by the monks. Eventually I entered the monastery, became a monk, and I was a monk for 30 years. And uh, during those years, I uh, lived a very, very austere life. Those, those men, those monks who live in monasteries, they live lives of great hardship and self-sacrifice. Uh, we used to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, to go to the Abbey Church to sing the praises of God. When I say now that we got up, don't imagine us crowded guys getting up from a nice comfortable bed like I've had here, up there. No, no. It was just uh, two planks on two trestles with a straw mattress and one very rough blanket. And uh, now what God wanted his praises sung for at two o'clock in the morning? I don't know. But it seemed a good idea to me way back then. We used to fast three days a week. We took the three vows of religion, which are called the vow of poverty, never to possess any money, to call our own, or any property of any kind, to call our own. And we took a vow of obedience so that we wouldn't uh, be doing our own will in any way, but in doing the will of someone else whom we regarded as the boss man, you consider yourself to be doing the will of God by not doing your own will. And about our chastity, which meant we renounced everything that had to do with romance and marriage and sex and all that good stuff. <clears throat> the purpose of it all was the very same as what's expressed in one of the chapters of the big book. I think it's chapter three. Uh, where ego has to be smashed if you're ever to get close to God or God is ever to get close to you. Ego has to be smashed, self-will, wanting what you want. And that was their way of doing it, and it was my way of doing it uh, for a number of years. Well, in the course of those years, of course, it was a very prayerful life, also. Uh, Very, very intense periods of meditation and uh, all that kind of thing. We used to study and read spiritual literature and work in the fields to maintain ourselves. I enjoyed it for many years. I was very happy. I was very, very happy living that life. It was during the war years, too. Most, uh, a lot of it at the beginning. <clears throat> Second World War. And we were on iron rations. And for some perverse reason, I loved it all. Don't forget what I told you. Maybe I was insane. Well, when I was 30 years of age, and by which time, at that time then, I was five years an ordained priest. That's something else again on top of being a monk. I was I had become a priest. And uh, in, when I was 30 years of age, that was in 1950. The war was five years behind us, ended in 45 in Europe. My superiors took it into their heads to send me off to Rome to study. 
in a Roman university. And I found myself living in a big, big monastery, which was a head monastery of the religious order I belonged to. Living in this big monastery with a whole pile of other monks from all parts of the world, as well as the resident Italians, and those other guys from different parts of the world were, like myself, going to different universities in Rome. And this is when I started to drink. Up to then, I had never, ever drank in any realist sense. As a priest, I said Mass every day, which involved drinking about that much wine at Mass. It meant absolutely nothing. But here I am now, living in this big monastery, uh, and life there is lived in the Italian style, when in Rome you do as Rome does. And twice a day, we would all congregate in the refectory, it was called. That's the big dining room of a monastery, the refectory. And there were all these bare wooden tables all around this huge big room. And you always sat at the same place each time with the same monk either side of you, according to your seniority, just like in the service. But all down the middle of these tables, there were these enormous flagons of wine. Really enormous things. They were made of I don't know what. They, they must have come down from the days of the Caesars big things, and they were placed one between each of two monks. You know, you weren't supposed to drink the whole thing. <laughs> they were put out there the same way you would put out a, 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 jug, a jug of water. You weren't meant to drink the whole jug. That's the way they were laid out every day, one between each two monks. Now, as I said, I had had no experience of uh, drinking in the real sense of drinking in my whole life before. So, twice a day, I found myself with these two enormous things literally within arm's reach of me. I was, this one here, I was to share with the fellow beside me here, and he never took more than about that much in the bottom of the little choke. The fellow beside me, this side, who was supposed to share this one with the fellow the far side of him, this guy never took any at all. He was weird. <laughs> and the fellow the far side of him just took that much. So twice a day, would you ever guess what happened? <laughs> Those two flagons at the end of the meal were empty. And I was delightfully and gloriously smashed. <laughs> no one had ever told me in all my 30 years on this planet up to then. No one had ever told me what happens when you get drunk. No one had ever told me. But I found out. And it was absolutely fantastic. I couldn't have imagined anything more fantastic. It was hilarious. Everything seemed funny, funny, funny. I should tell you that in that refectory at those meals, the holy monks ate in dead silence. <laughs> and halfway down the wall, one wall, there was a kind of a pulpit coming out of the wall and there was a guy, a holy monk there in that pulpit, reading very holy, pious, wonderful stuff. We were all supposed to be eating and listening to this wonderful holy stuff. Well, it all seemed awful funny to me. <laughs> and I roared laughing at the whole thing. <laughs> and they were all nudging me, shh, shh. Well, that's the way it all started. Just like that. You know, I, 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 it's hopeless to try... Would you believe I was fool enough to try to explain to those guys I was telling you about that I spoke to last week what happens when you get drunk. Anyway. I mean, I was enthusing about it. That's the mistake I made. 
to me, the whole thing was like like Alice in Wonderland blundering through the, the door in the, in the wood and finding out this whole enchanted country. That was the land of intoxication. Oh, my God, it was out of this world. Now, I was drunk twice a day. Every day. But that was only for openers. You see, there were other guys from different parts of the world there in that big, big crowd going to these various universities in Rome. And uh, there were guys there from places like America and Canada and Australia as well as England and Ireland, English-speaking ones. And we all clubbed together because there we were in the midst of all these weirdos talking Italian and German and French and all these barbarians. So we had to stay together, you know. And we were all far from home. And we did have money <clears throat> that our superiors in our monasteries back home supplied us with. We were supposed to buy books and do all our deep research at the university, use the money for that sort of thing, you see. But we didn't need all the money for that, you see. So, <clears throat> so we laid in what was necessary for uh, cheering ourselves up. <laughs> well, they made my room. By the way, when you live in a monastery, you don't live in a room, you live in a cell. Some of you might have experience of that kind of thing. I don't. <laughs> they made my cell the bar. I had extra shelves in there, and they laid in all these bottles, and these bottles were in rows upon my shelves, discreetly covered with a blanket. And we co-opted one Italian into our midst. Just one gave him his privileged status to be one of us. His family owned a winery outside of Rome. <laughs> and so I lived to see the day when this big barrel of wine was secreted up the back stairs, along the cloister, and into my room, and was set up on a trestle with a faucet to it. Well, now, what more do you want? <laughs> there was my setup for my honeymoon with booze. I don't know how to tell you about it. I uh, was supposed to be engaged in deep study, and uh, I didn't go out much. <laughs> I, went, I went to my classes in the university, and I had to write a doctorate dissertation, and uh, that was written entirely under the influence of you-know-what. <clears throat> Sometimes I read it now, and I wonder, what the hell is it all about? <laughs> Incredible stuff. Well, they were my first three years with booze. I don't know how to tell you about it at all. As I say, I very seldom went out. I do remember seeing, you know the thing in, in Rome, that St. Peter's? That huge headquarters of you know what, and there, the, and I saw it from a distance one time with the big dome and all this, uh, and it seemed to be. I thought it was a carousel. It seemed to be going around and around and around. That's all I ever saw of it from a distance. Well, after three years, they gave me some degrees, and I came home, and home meant back to my monastery, and I was appointed to teach, and that was the fulfilment. That was the fulfilment of. A secret, a secret ambition that I had hugged to myself. I did want to be <clears throat> a brilliant professor. I really loved my studies. I loved them. And uh, I, I don't know, I, 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 I had the kind of a mind and a, a sort of a, a taste for all that sort of stuff that wasn't just what you might call academic, but I loved to teach. I loved to teach. I prided myself on making any dunderhead understand anything that I understood. To transfer my, my uh, experience of it in here and make it his or her experience. I had a knack in being able to teach, and I loved it. But also, I had a knack in being able to influence other people's thinking. Now, when I came back from Rome, as you can well guess, I found out that I couldn't function at all without booze. It had become part of my whole life. 
and I became a closet drinker. Now, if you want to know from me how a monk living in a monastery with a vow of poverty, no money, to come, no money of his own ever, all his comings and goings under the vigilance of a superior, can't move without permission, uh, how in the world, living in those kind of circumstances, a guy can have his own constant supply of booze secreted away? How? How come? Well, all I can tell you is, I'm going to tell you how. All I can tell you is, I learned to live a day at a time before ever I met you lot. <laughs> it works. It works. What I forgot to tell you is, these monks worked. They worked as well as lived this weird life in the monastery, this prayerful, studious life. Um, and the kind of work they did, ah, you don't see much of it nowadays. It's, these kind of guys were the kind of guys that would go out from their monastery uh, in twos or ones or threes or whatever to different parishes. You know that other kinds of priests run parishes all over the place. Now those parish priests in the old days would apply to a monastery like the one I lived in for some of these monks to come to the parish and give what was called a parish mission. And that meant that these holy, holy men would go to these parishes and live there for two weeks, three weeks, or whatever. And the people in those days would crowd into the churches. And these monks would preach God's mind, God's heart to them. They were looked on in the same way that the ancient Jews looked on Moses. You know, Moses would be up on the mountain, wrapped up with God. And he'd come down into the plains to speak to God's people, God's mind, God's heart. That's the kind of guys these were looked on as being. And they would also go to uh, the convents of nuns all over the place and talk to them about the sublimities, what it means to be totally, totally in love with God, what it means to enjoy God's love of them, what it means to live a life of total, total dedication to God's interests. That's the kind of work they did. Well, <clears throat> I would be sent out on these jobs, you see, as well as doing my job as a professor in the monastery. And uh, the pastor would notice, oh, the good father needs plenty of the spirit to do this preaching business. So he would supply me with plenty of the spirit. And I'd let him know that I needed the spirit. And uh, every night it would be available. It would be in my room, be supplied with When it come time to go back home, uh, to my monastery, he'd give me a bottle or two to put in my bag, and not only that, he'd give me the offering for the monastery, but he'd give me a little you-know-what for myself, you know, just, that's between ourselves. I want you to notice that this business of loving God perfectly had gone on the back burner. <laughs> first things first had come to mean something to me, different from what it meant to other people. But there's the kind of life that I was gradually evolving. A life of secret drinking, a life of uh, all that goes along with drinking. I had definitely, unknown to myself, become dependent. Dependent on it. And also, I had become a changed man. Um... The first indication that I had there was something funny going on was when some of my colleagues in the monastery came along to me, my classmates, who had been my classmates, came along and said, my God, you've changed. Boy, have you ever. You've changed. Terribly. And I used to look in the mirror when I was shaving and talk to myself. and say, what the hell? What are they talking about? Of course I've changed. I've become a very brilliant man. I know stuff that they have never even heard of, that Pappy Yobbs. I'm a highly educated, insightful, profound, intelligent man. Changed? Of course I've changed. And they don't like it. <laughs> That's their problem. <laughs> oh, yes, I had become a bit impatient of fools. I had become unbelievably proud, arrogant. Need I go on? Uh, belligerent, short-tempered, 
Paul mouthed it. Oh, yeah. The whole smear. I wasn't, I don't know how long I had been teaching when the boss man sent for me. And I was wondering, I wonder, I wonder which university, what chair of philosophy or theology now am I going to be offered? When I walked into his office, I looked at his face, and the barometer was very low. So I stood there, and he didn't look, he didn't look into my eyes, but he just said, <clears throat> the worst day's work I ever did was send you to Rome. All it did for you was it made you an alcoholic. Did you hear that dirty, filthy word? That's all it did for you. It made you an alcoholic. Your conduct in class with the young men that you're teaching has been atrocious, appalling. You're a scandal and an outrage. It's unacceptable and it's not going to be accepted one more minute. I don't know who you think you are, but I'm going to tell you what you are not from now on. Your teaching assignment is terminated right now. And I will see to it that you will never, ever, at least as long as I am alive, Occupy any position of trust like the one you have occupied up to now. You may go. I don't know how to put into words what I felt inside. The sense of outrage was just indescribable. I want you to know that the idea of calling me an alcoholic seemed to me the most uttermost, outrageous non-truth that could possibly be expressed. That's how I felt. I remember when I walked outside, you see, that guy, the, 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 when I walked outside, I met some of my colleagues in the hallway, and I said, you won't believe what that jackass has just told me. And I told them what he told me. I told them. Do you know something? They did believe it. I couldn't understand it. My whole, my whole life was shattered, shattered. Literally all that had ever mattered to me was gone. I was reduced in the ranks, and I was required to do what you needed as I saw life. No brains whatever for doing. No brains. Just to go out on those chores, to give those parish missions I talked about, Go to those places to talk to nuns and religious sisters and people like that about God, about God, about God. God. I hated it. I was full of resentment. I was full of bitterness. I was full of contempt. I was full of anger. And I did not see uh, my drinking as having anything to do with being an alcoholic. I was drinking simply because thing my life was not going the way it was supposed to go. The way anybody with any brains, anybody with any judgment would see my life was supposed to go. My God, the amount of knowledge I had, the amount of brilliance and competence I had, and you put me doing what you needed. No brains, whatever, for doing. Obviously. This wasn't going to last. And I was only drinking because life was not going the way it was supposed to go. And it was my way of compensating. It never even dawned on me. But the reality was the other way around. It was because I was drinking that life was going the way it was going. I've never done It was going to take 25 years for that to get there. 25 years for what was overwhelmingly obvious to every other person, young and old, who ever saw me or had anything to do with me. What they could all see 
and only told me long years afterwards that it was I could not see. And from this on, my story is a story of a bum. An utter bum. A closet drinker, a phony, a hypocrite. I, uh, I would stand up in that pulpit and I could speak very impressively about God. About God. About loving God. About accepting God's will. Settling for it. It's all that matters. About being tolerant. Forgiving of injuries. About being humble. Every single syllable. Every syllable. Every syllable. Was a condemnation. Of myself. And I knew it. I knew it. I knew that. No one needed to tell me that I was a hypocrite and a phony. Nobody knew that better than I did. I used to sit in the confessional, for instance, when God's humble, honest, good people would come in one at a time. It's only taken a fifth step, that's all. But this would be at night after the mission service was over. And the other clergy would be over in the, in, in the parish house and the bottle would be out. And here I'd be with this one and that one coming in one after another. And they'd be fumbling and hesitating and precious drinking time would be wasted. And I would find myself saying, Look, will you for God's sake, let's get on with this thing and get out of here. <laughs> I would, uh, <laughs> I would go along to little kids in the classroom, say on a Monday morning, oh, Monday morning. And there'd be two steam hammers banging together inside my head. And I was supposed to ask the little kids some little question, the catechism stuff. You know. And an innocent, lovely little child would stumble about some answer. And I would blow my stack like a mad barbarian. And the phone would be ringing in the bishop's office or the pastor's office. Get this bum out of here. It's the story of my life. Get this guy out of here. I decided that... Uh, England, England that was to be converted by me was not worthy of me. And I applied to the supreme authority in the church. Yes, I got my own superior to apply to the Pope to get me an annulment of my vows as a monk and I was going to join a diocese. I had to remain a priest, of course. Just my vows as a monk were to be done away with. I was to no longer have to live that life. But I had to remain a priest, and I pulled wires and all that usual sort of stuff. And somebody got the Bishop of San Diego, California, to receive this brilliant man into his diocese. He would be an asset beyond all possible exaggeration. <laughs> Boy, did he regret it. <laughs> you know, when we take, when we Irish guys take a, a, a geographic, Half measures availed us nothing. <laughs> 6,000 miles away between myself and the scene of many, many crimes. Went off out there to start life all over again, to be just an ordinary priest working in a parish. Brought my problem with me, needless to say. The first assignment I was given when I went out there, it's unbelievable. The very first assignment was to a pastor, who was an Irish pastor, a crabby old you-know-what. And the first thing this guy asked me when I arrived was, do you like to drink? I said, yeah. Oh, why, why, will, you, will you drink with me? How lucky can you be? <laughs> the guy was a chronic alcoholic. <laughs> now, in case you don't know, I want to tell you that when two Irishmen who are alcoholics get drinking together, 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 remember that don't call us the fighting Irish for nothing. <laughs> and you need to keep out of the line of fire. Literally anything can happen. There was one night when the neighbors phoned the police.
I can still see the red light swirling out of there, like you were talking about. Like. I was reassigned. <laughs> Those years out there in California, my drinking years, I was a dreadfully lonely man. There are things about my own family life that I didn't tell you. My father died when I was only 15 when I left Ireland and entered the monastery. And when I entered the monastery, unknown to myself, my mother became a chronic alcoholic. I mean chronic, right down into the gutter. I knew nothing about all this all my years as a young monk. She found out the war was on and she was over in England. Anyway, the war was on and uh, we only corresponded very, very, very spasmodically, very, very erratically. The greatest day in the life of a person like myself who has no oh, ideals about loving God and becoming an instrument of his help for other people. This day of your life is the day you're ordained a priest. The happiest day of your life. Fulfillment of a lifetime of waiting and longing and praying. It was the most miserable day of my life <clears throat> because my mother turned up at my ordination blind drunk. I was shattered. We were allowed a couple of weeks of vacation home, at home after we were ordained. I had nowhere to go. <clears throat> My mother was an only child. And so I had no aunts or uncles, my mother's side. My father had three sisters, and each of those three became nuns. He had one brother, and that brother died in a seminary, preparing to be a priest. So I'm the only Irish man on the planet with no cousins. When I went for the first time after being ordained to visit with my only brother, I made a shattering discovery there. He had run away from home and the war had broken out and joined to get away from my mother and joined the British Navy. And he was, <clears throat> the British ship was blown up and he became an invalid. And he married the girl who nursed him. I never knew anything about all this until I went for my vacation to meet him. He had married a girl who was a good, solid Baptist. And he had himself converted to becoming a Baptist. And so he rather regarded me as something from the far side of Mars. What I'm saying is, when I was out in California, I was the ultimate loner. I belonged to nobody, knew nobody. And so, I used to have a lot of self-pity. I eventually got to know a family that sort of adopted me. Catholic family. And uh, I was drinking like a fish at the time. And they didn't mind. They supplied me with the stuff. Anyway, to make a long story short, they invited me to go on a vacation with them, the whole family, <clears throat> down to Mexico, to a place where they owned a couple of big trailers that had been broken into one big one. It was a big family. And towards the end of that vacation, uh, the wife, the mother in the family, developed tennis elbow. And the husband decided to bring her back up to San Diego to see a doctor. And that left Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill in charge. And here we all were, these kids. They ranged in age from a college kid who's the eldest one, his name was Matt, I don't know, he was 22 or 3 or something, right down to a little nipper. Good Catholic family, you know what I mean? Yeah. Here we all were, and it was coming late at night, and I'd been drinking as usual all day, and I upended the bottle into my glass and threw the bottle in the trash can. And there was a, <clears throat> a radio blaring away in the uh, trailer. And I said, now boys and girls, let's switch that thing off and go to our beds and have a bit of peace and quiet. And the 
they switched it off. And I got up to uh, go to the corner of the trailer that was my room. And the eldest son, Matt, stationed himself in the doorway going into my little corner. And he had his thumbs in his belt and he looked at me in a very hostile way. And he said, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going to bed. Where else? He said, no, you're not. Not with that. And he pointed at the glass of whiskey in my hand. The most important glass of whiskey of the day, the one you're going to pass out with. <laughs> no, you're not, he said. I said, who said I'm not? He said, I did, buddy. And I'm going to say a little bit more that needs to be said around here. That has been needing to be said for a long time. You come around my family freeloading. Getting your free liquor. And you think you have some sort of God-given right to this because you wear a damn collar back to front. Well, I have news for you. You are not welcome around here. Because all you are is an ignorant, Irish, savage alcoholic. Did you hear that dirty, filthy word? The second time in over 25 years. The second time that that word was ever addressed to me. And moreover, he said, I want you to know this. You should never drink at all. Because you're the kind of guy that when you drink, you have a total personality change. You become a total savage. And I want you to know, and I'm speaking on behalf of my parents and my whole family, we want you to get lost permanently. We've had enough of you. We don't want you around here anymore. Did I tell you, crowd, that I'm a very brilliant man? <laughs> I stood up off that chair and tried to walk past him with dignity. And he made a grab at the glass and he ended up knocking it out of my hand. And that was the last whiskey in the house. And when that happened, something happened that I, I think some of you will understand, maybe, or I don't know. I don't understand it myself. It's easy to just say, I, I went berserk and left it, leave it at that. But what it felt like is indescribable. When my last gulp of whiskey was gone, I wasn't to have it. The one I wanted, that I'd been building up to all day. Something happened in here. In here. But it was an explosion. Just an explosion. And just fury, fury, anger. All devouring. Just swept through me like a, like, like a flame. And swept me off my feet. And I went at that guy's throat, and I wanted to get him. I wanted to squeeze and see the eyes bulge out of his head. I wanted to kill him. Really. And if the rest of them hadn't been there, and the screaming and hollering were just out of sight, God knows where I'd be today. I don't know. They dragged me off him anyway. I half wrecked that trailer and I stormed out of there and I knew there was a, a bar up the, uh, up the thing there and I went in there and I bought what I hope was my last bottle of booze. Tequila. And I lay out on the beach it was after midnight, and I never know when my sobriety date, which side of, of, of 12 o'clock it was. It was either September 8th or September 9th, 1975. And I passed out. And when I came to the next morning, the sun was well up. I stood up, and I looked out at the, at the ocean. I could see the trailer way down. I looked out at the waves. And I remembered the first time I had ever seen waves. It was when my poor father brought me up to that little ship. 
when I was 15 year old and I set out on my journey to get to love God perfectly. It's all I had ever wanted. And as I looked out now at the waves coming in there in the Pacific Ocean, Mexico, I said, my God, you've come a long way, dear. You've come a long way. Last night you wanted to murder a man. You wanted to murder a man. You really did. All because of booze. All because of booze. That's all. That's all. You know, one of these days you probably will do it. Because that's what booze does to you every time. Every time. You make a jack. You'll either murder someone someday or you'll be murdered. And don't think you're going to quit. <laughs> Forget it. You're not. You've tried and it's true. You've tried and you know you can't. So you're not going to go on living with it and you can't live without it. Now what are you going to do? A most horrible feeling crept all through me. All through me. I'll never forget it. I was shaking. I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. I was seeing a ghost. I was seeing myself as I really was. Caught. Trapped. Doomed. It's a horrible feeling if you've never had it. Doomed. And I looked up into that sky and I said, God, have you forgotten me? I can't blame you. I can't blame you. Because I have forgotten you. I was still that little boy who wanted to love God. And that want was still there, still there. No way I could see I could ever do it. It was just hopeless. I had lost everything. Everything. There wasn't a single human being on this planet who cared a damn whether I lived or died. No family. Nobody who gave a damn. And the people who had tried to give a damn, I had alienated them. All through booze. I had a, a, a kind of a door sort of opened at the side of my brain and I could see myself through the years going way, way back. All the times, all the times that I had blown it, blown it, blown it. Blown it when they tried to make me a man of competence and brilliance and a great professor. I blew it all through booze. I blew it everywhere I had ever been. Every row, every friendship, every intimacy, every pleasant thing there ever was in my life. Shattered. Destroyed. And now I'm alone. A mess. Part of a mess. I never, I never want to forget that more. And for the first time, literally in years, my God, I have been, I have been a priest all those years. I don't want to make Roman Catholic or anybody here, but when a guy in my job does what he does every morning, he believes that what he's holding there in his hands has him face to face. He's God. His judge. His maker. I was face to face with someone I had vowed to love. With someone that I wanted to matter to me more than anybody in all the world. Face to face with him, and I'd come from the pigsty the night before. Oh, yes. Pitiable and incomprehensible demoralization had been the story of my life. I had experimented to see what I was missing in all the ways that are very shame. And I'd stood before him, feeling horrible. There are people in this fellowship that I identify with more than any others. It's people who have loved, 
who have been happy, who have been involved in a lovely relationship. And then came the booze, and the drugs, and the madness, and the craziness. And you wrecked it all. You wrecked it. I wrecked it. I stood there, I don't know how long. God knows I don't know how long. And I just said, God, help me. I knew I needed help. I didn't know where the hell to look for. So I did. I went back to that trailer when I saw that those kids had gone out of it. I was too proud to meet up with them. I got my things out of there. I had my own car. I came flying back up to San Diego. It wasn't far away. And I had to go on a job to preach. Always preaching. Oh, God. Always talking about God. I had to go on a preaching job up to Los Angeles, where I was a stranger. But I wanted to do something before I went on that job. I wanted to somehow or other do something that made me feel that I was reaching out to get a grip of God somehow. And all I knew to do was to do something I'd never done for a long time. Go to confession. Get rid of the filth. Get rid of it somehow. But I didn't want to go to any priest who knew me. And so I was up in that strange city. To make a long story short, I wandered around off the freeway, on the free side streets, and I found a little, little Mexican church. Little, broken down little place. I rang the doorbell of the rectory. And this old guy with a collar on him opened the door. I said, Father, will you hear my confession? Oh, yes, he said, of course. He brought me in, he sat in his little chair in his lounge, and I knelt at his elbow. I was thinking to high heaven. I was, had the sweats and the shakes. And I told him my crimes. As much as I could remember them, I knew it wasn't a thousand parts. And when I was through, he sort of folded his arms and he looked at me. And he said, why did you come to me with all this garbage? I thought it was very strange. I said I'd come to get God's forgiveness for my sins. What the heck else do you think? Oh, he said, I know. But why did you pick on me? <laughs> oh, I said, uh, because you don't know me. I hope. Oh, he said, I don't. You needn't worry. And furthermore, I don't want to. <laughs> but he said, I know a heck of a lot more about you than you know about you. I know precisely and exactly what's wrong with you. It's awful simple, he said. All that's wrong is, you have a disease. You're sick. A frightful disease. And you've got it. It's called alcoholism. And one of the things about this disease is that you deny you ever have it. That's why you get so mad when someone calls you an alcoholic. And I mean mad. <laughs> you get mad, all right, he said, yeah. And he began to tell me about this thing called alcoholism. It's no fault of your own. It's because of the way your body chemistry is put together. Then you're allergic to this drug alcohol. It gets into your bloodstream. It goes all through your system. It goes through your brain. That's what makes you drunk. But if you're an alcoholic, it alters your brain. It alters it. And it programs you to think all kinds of nonsense and to think you're thinking sense. That's all. They're just nuts. That's all. You're programmed to think that all kinds of things are good for you that aren't. But you think they are. And keep on thinking they are, even when anyone else can see that they aren't. Starting with booze, of course. You think you know what's good for you in all kinds of areas, but you don't know. You think that all kinds of things are good for you that are actually destructive of you. You're programmed to destroy yourself. Not merely to destroy yourself physically, but to destroy your own estimation of yourself. You do things and say things that are going to make you hate yourself, and you do them and hate yourself. And again and again. And that's all that you've been coughing up to me here in this so-called confession. You're programmed to carry on this way. You're just a puppet on a string. You know, he said, to commit a sin there as any educated Catholic knows. Did I tell you I'm a very brilliant man? 
To commit a sin, he said, you, 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 you have to be a mature, responsible human being. So you needn't worry. <laughs> you haven't been that for years, he said. If ever. There isn't a single sin in all this stuff from start to finish. But he said, are you sick? Oh, boy, boy, are you ever? And I was wondering all the time I was kneeling, what, what have I walked into here? Are there two lunatics in this room or only one? And if one, which, which? <laughs> you know, the book talks about ne standing at the turning point. I knelt at the turning point. I don't know what to make of this guy. But then he said, think the clincher, the clincher. He said, you told me, and I had told him before, when I talked to him, when I came in at first, that I had sort of wandered around and taken a pig and a poke, didn't want He said, you think you came to me by some kind of fluke? Brother, you were guided here. You were brought to me, to where you are right now. That is certain. He said, utterly certain. Because he said, you see, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> And I'm a recovering alcoholic in an outfit called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am the only priest in Alcoholics Anonymous for miles around here. <laughs> and if you think you came to me by some kind of fluke, you're even stupider than you look. <laughs> and then he started in to tell me about this Alcoholics Anonymous deal. This fantastic thing. This remedy for what's wrong with me. It's a re it works. It is as certain to work as anything is certain. If you go for it. But you see, you're going to have a hell of a job going for it. Because you know it all, don't you? You know so much. And he said, the very first thing that you have to do to make this thing work for you. Is to stop thinking that you're a sinner. You shouldn't be here at all. This is not where you belong, kneeling there confessing sins. You have no sin. You've never committed a sin since you crossed the dividing line between being non-addicted and being addicted to alcohol. Because from that point onwards, when you became addicted, you became a puppet on a string. Your disease was dictating to you how to feel, what to do, what attitudes to take up, what act reactions and to engage in, to life. You're just a puppet on the street. And as long as you think that you are responsible for everything that's been going on, that you've shared with me, you are never going to get well. Never. You're powerless. Your whole life is unmanageable. Nothing is ever going to begin to happen until you settle for that. And I still wondered, my God, is this a lunatic? Can I really believe him? If I do believe him and I die tonight, where will I end up? It's a frightful risk. Frightful risk. God, I'm so glad I took it. Oh, I had to go for treatment. But I had to keep bombarding at me. To keep bombarding at me. I am not a sinner. Who has to become good. I'm a sick, sick man. Who has to become well. And because I am. God loves me out of sight. God loves me out of sight. God loves me as I am. He will never love me more. And he will never love me less. Whatever happens. It took me a long time to believe. I do today. When I came into the program after going for treatment, I got me a sponsor, and he had no religion at all. That's one thing that I have uh, realized. I have got to get in touch with ordinary people. God, keep me away. Keep me away from the professionals. <laughs> Why didn't I remember that last week? <laughs> And this guy told me, 
was my sponsor. Okay, go to meetings, read the big book, blah, 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 all the usual stuff. And after a while, then he turned and said, well, have you read the big book? I said, yeah. Did you read the chapter to the agnostic? Ah, Richard, I said, you know the job. Did you read the... Ch well, no, I said, I didn't. Well, read the... F read the thing, he said. I hope the committee is noticing I didn't say it. I didn't say it. <laughs> read it. But he said, before you read it, let me tell you how to read it. Because a smart ass like you will never read what's there. The moment you see the heading to that chapter, you're going to say, now they're going to try to prove to me that there's a God. As long as you think that that's what that chapter's all about, you're not going to read it at all. You're not going to get what's there. It's not trying to prove to you that there's a God. It's trying to do something much more marvelous. It's trying to get you to do something awful simple that will make it possible for God to prove to you that there is a God if he wants to. Now go and read it. And I did. And I've never read anything in my life to compare with the wisdom of that chapter. Never anything. That chapter is trying to get us to notice the strange world we live in. It's a wonderful world, and all kinds of wonderful things happen. So, start wondering. How come they're all happening? What's making them happen? You wonder. Is there an intelligent being behind it all? Or did it all happen by chance? You wonder, you wonder, you wonder. So, wonder. You look at some things. You look at... You sow a seed in the soil and a flower grows. You know, that's wonderful. How come? Does it happen by chance? You look at a steel girder. And you say, no, nah, nothing there. But let an atomic scientist introduce you to it. Each atom is like the universe. With neutrons and protons gyrating around each other. And burrowing around at a sheer speed, giving off energy. And that energy constitutes the hardness of steel. Little lads holding up huge, big, high-rise high buildings, building around, holding them up. It's fantastic. You look at other areas of reality where there's hunger and starvation and violence and death and horribleness. You say, can there be a good God at all? The wonder. So wonder is all it's saying. Wonder. And there comes a point when you've got to make your mind up. We finally came to see that faith in some kind of God had somehow to become part of our makeup. <laughs> but how? We had to search fearlessly. And Richard said to me, Does that remind you of any step? Oh, the fourth step. Yeah, the fourth step. Brilliant, he said. Keep coming back. <laughs> we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. Where? we found the great reality deep down within our own selves. In the last analysis, it is only there he can be found. And when found, he was as much a fact as we ourselves were. Every one of those sentences is like a sledgehammer. We have to search fearlessly. Make a searching and fearless investigation deep down within our own selves. And you will find him there. What is it you find when you make that fearless investigation down into the very roots of your own self, the way you take over? You get in touch with your own powerlessness. My powerlessness to be content with my lot in life. My powerlessness to enjoy it and not just endure it. My powerlessness to my powerlessness is to get rid of my resentments, my bitterness, my hates, my jealousies. My powerlessness to stop wanting to change someone. My powerlessness to stop. My powerlessness in a thousand areas. And what do I do with all that when I get in touch with it? You bring it up to the surface. Doug told you last night. You put it out there and you say, are you there? 
Are you there, or are you only a myth and a big mistake that we are all making? Are you real? I hope you're real. I prefer that you're real rather than that you aren't. Be real. Please, I want you to be. I, w I don't want to be the only one to be able to do something about all this stuff because I can't do anything about it. I can't, I can't. I want someone who can. I want to stop being this kind of person I'd always be. Don't laugh. I want to be humble. Don't laugh. I want to be humble. I found out that the only happy people I want to be accepting of people as they are without wanting to change them. I want to be that kind of person. I want to be outgoing, tolerant, forgiving. Please change me. Change me. I want you to do it. And then you go on living. Say that every day. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. And keep living one day at a time doing whatever you think you would be doing if you was there. And one fine day it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It'll be awful simple. The phone will ring, maybe. And there'll be someone at the end of that phone. Someone whose guts you could never stand. And you'll find yourself saying, Oh, is that what you want? Oh, sure, I can go along with that. That's fine. Yeah, I can go along with it. I'd be very happy to, actually. Sure, yeah. Hang on. You walk halfway across the room. What the hell is happening around here? I'm going queer. Yeah, you are. You're going from being insane to being sane. It's weird. You're going to find yourself being empowered without rehearsing it, without gritting your teeth and forcing yourself to it. You're going to find yourself being empowered to be the kind of person you are powerless to be and you know it. You're going to find yourself being empowered not even to want to be the kind of perverse jackass you can't help yourself being, and you know it. And when you find yourself being empowered, you know then that there's a power greater than yourself. There's no other way for knowing. There is no other way for knowing. You don't find it out with a head trip. That's what the guys in my job haven't found out yet. There is no way of knowing but the way this thing is telling us. And when you find yourself enjoying being the kind of person you're being empowered to be, then you know that whatever or whoever this power is, loves you. Loves you. No, it's a kindly, kindly power. When I was a little kid, sometimes I did play with the kids in the backyard, and I'd get all cut and dirty, my clothes torn, and I come in the back door of the kitchen. There'd be my mother at the sink. She'd look at me. What have you been doing to yourself? She'd take my clothes off and wash me and make me feel all clean and silky, put on nice clean clothes, smelling lovely. She cleaned up my mess and she made me feel good. That's how I found out my mother when she was sober. There is no other way for finding out. There is a power greater than yourself that loves you out of sight. You'll only find out when you let him clean up your mess and make you feel good. I started out my life wanting to love God with all my little heart. I failed for many years. I do today. What do you say to people who have brought about in your life the only thing you've ever wanted brought about? I don't know what to say to you people. Only thank you for giving me all that I've ever had, all that I've ever wanted, for giving me God. And I thank God for giving me all of you. I do love you. Thank you.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.